Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to our daily Hindu analysis. Before we begin, don't forget to join our Telegram channel for regular updates on current affairs. You can use the link provided in the description box below or you can even scan the QR code that has been provided over here. So let's get started with the analysis of today's the Hindu newspaper by looking at an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. This article refers to the landmark visit of Bangladeshi Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina to India during which several key issues have been discussed and several important agreements have been signed. So in this context let's examine the latest developments in the India Bangladesh relationship and let's start by looking at the key agreements that were signed yesterday. Following the meeting between Prime Minister Modi and Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina seven key agreements were signed between India and Bangladesh which includes an agreement between water resources ministry of both the countries to share the waters of the kushiara river which happens to be a transboundary river between india and bangladesh that enters bangladesh from the northeast of india along with this key agreements have been signed between the railways ministries that provides for training of bangladeshi railway personnel along with collaboration in it systems and it applications between the two railways then another agreement has been signed between the national judicial academy of india and the supreme court of bangladesh to provide for training and capacity building of judicial officers of bangladesh in india then two agreements related to science and technology have also been signed between india csir and its bangladeshi counterpart and as well as between isro and the bangladeshi space agency to provide for collaboration in the area of space technology and research and development and the last agreement pertains to cooperation in broadcasting between prasar bharti and its bangladeshi counterpart along with signing these key agreements both the countries have even launched several important projects so in this context let's examine these connectivity and infrastructure projects that help in connecting india with bangladesh and help in bringing the two countries closer the two leaders inaugurated the maitri power plant which is a coal fired thermal power plant that has been built in bangladesh with indian assistance india had provided around 1.6 billion dollars in assistance through a concessional loan and this power plant has come up at ramphal in the kulna province which you can see over here in the map that borders the indian state of west bengal next the critical rupsha bridge has been inaugurated which connects the mongla port of bangladesh with the kulna province and further with petropole along the indian border see the mongla port located over here is a strategic port of bangladesh that opens towards the bay of bengal and india has ambitious plans to tap into the ports of bangladesh including mongla and as well as the chittagong port that you see over here not just to promote trade between the two countries but also to create a alternative route to link mainland india with northeast of india through these sea ports of bangladesh mainland india can connect with the inland navigation networks of bangladesh that have been set up over its river systems such as the meghna jamuna and the others and thus directly access the northeastern states by bypassing the siliguri corridor over here which happens to be a strategic choke point for india then the kulna dashna railway link has also been inaugurated that further brings the mongla port closer to india and helps in utilizing the trade facilities that have been set up at petropole in west bengal where india has set up a integrated check post in order to promote trade between the two countries and a key railway link connecting parvatipura with konya has also been inaugurated that further enhances connectivity between west bengal and bangladesh these connectivity and infrastructure projects they define the india bangladesh relationship as they not only bring the two economies closer but they also help in bringing the people of the two countries closer because india and bangladesh share extensive historical cultural and people to people relations and by enabling better connectivity through such infrastructure projects the two countries are looking to give a boost to their economies here it's important to note that india shares its longest land border with bangladesh amongst all its neighboring countries 
which stretches to around 4096 kilometers in length thus making bangladesh a very significant neighbor of india along with this the two countries also share around 54 transboundary rivers which includes the drainage basins of the ganga river the brahmaputra the barak feni tista kushiara and the others it's in this context that the kushiara water sharing agreement that has been signed becomes very very important for our exams because this happens to be the first water sharing agreement between the two countries that has been signed in the last 28 years the last water sharing agreement that was signed was in 1996 when sheikh hasina had been elected as the prime minister for the first time and her party awami league had started pursuing close relations with india which led to the signing of the ganga water sharing treaty in 1996 Since India and Bangladesh share so many transboundary rivers there are bound to be disputes with regard to water sharing and management of the drainage basin and one of the key standing disputes has been the Tista dispute which Bangladesh has been very eager to settle as soon as possible because Tista happens to be the lifeline for Bangladesh just as it is for India yesterday we spoke about this in our daily quiz as well but despite repeated attempts especially since 2011 The Tista Water Agreement has still not been signed due to political compulsions in the state of West Bengal. As a result of India's failure to resolve the Tista water dispute, Bangladesh has often expressed its displeasure and even during the recent visit, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina pointed out that India is yet to fulfill its commitment to resolve the Tista water sharing issue and she has expressed optimism that hopefully the issue would be settled soon. It's in this context that the signing of the kushiara water sharing treaty becomes very very important and you need to know where the kushiara river flows and what benefits will it bring for india and bangladesh see the kushiara happens to be one of the distributaries of the barak river which you see over here in the northeast of india it flows through various northeastern states and finally passes through assam and as the barak river crosses the border into bangladesh it distributes or splits into the kushiara that you see over here and the surma working out the sharing of these waters was a long pending issue between the two countries and finally india bangladesh have signed an agreement to provide for fair sharing of these waters of the kushiara river this agreement is expected to bring benefits to the southern parts of assam which is heavily dependent on the barak and the kushiara and as well as to the silhet region in bangladesh then during yesterday's consultations the two leaders have even proposed a free trade agreement between the two countries and both the sides have launched negotiations for a comprehensive economic partnership agreement once this agreement is worked out and signed this would become india's first major fta with a neighboring country in south asia and is expected to bring tremendous benefits to both the sides because for india Bangladesh happens to be its largest trading partner in South Asia and even for Bangladesh India happens to be its largest trading partner the bilateral trading volume has more than doubled in the last 5 years thus highlighting the potential for trade opportunities and can provide a big boost for exports of both the countries key sectors like textiles jute pharmaceuticals and even automobiles electronics and engineering equipment all these industries can benefit from a comprehensive economic partnership agreement as it will reduce the tariffs and the barriers to trade in fact india bangladesh they are already part of the safta which is a free trade agreement under the sarc framework and through this free trade arrangement they have already extended duty free benefits to various imports of each other but the future potential of safta is very limited due to constant tensions between india and pakistan which has derailed the objectives of the sarc organization hence a stand alone independent free trade agreement between india bangladesh will boost trade between the two countries and both the sides have begun negotiations for this in these trade negotiations the primary focus would be on the trade deficit which currently is to the disadvantage of bangladesh and both the sides would be trying to work out solutions in order to reduce the trade gap Bangladesh in particular has a concern over here because very soon Bangladesh would be categorized as a developing nation by 2026 
and as a result it is going to lose some of the trade benefits and advantages as currently it is classified as a least developed country so before bangladesh transitions to the status of a developing nation as per wto both the sides would be looking to work out a free trade agreement so that they can minimize the barriers to trade and boost the trading volume between the two countries then finally with regard to defense and military cooperation between the two countries bangladesh has provided india with a wish list of defense equipment that it would like to procure from india by making use of the 500 million dollar line of credit that india had extended earlier now let's take up a column from page number 6 that refers to the controversy surrounding the visinjum port which is being built by the adani group in kerala see the visinjum port which is coming up near trivandrum is all set to become a critical transshipment terminal for india primarily because of its strategic location if you observe the map this is where the visinjum port is coming up located right at the southern tip of the indian peninsula a few kilometers down south of tiruvananthapuram and this port and transshipment facility will be located just around 10 nautical miles away from the east west shipping axis which happens to be a major international shipping route this key shipping route forms a connection between the east and the west connecting europe with asia and provides a key link in the indo pacific region this key shipping lane that links important ports in west asia such as dubai jeddah salala and the others with key ports in south asia and southeast asia such as colombo singapore etc it passes right next to india and yet india has not been able to capitalize on the route due to lack of advanced port facilities in india a large part of india's exports and imports are still dependent on foreign port facilities such as colombo singapore dubai and the others it's in this context that india has laid out an ambitious plan to develop a major port and a shipping terminal at visinjum and due to its ideal location and geography it is all set to become one of india's deepest ports with around 80% of india's transshipment in the future passing through this port it will essentially help establish india as a key shipping and logistics hub in the indian ocean and this port facility is going to compete with major international ports at colombo singapore and dubai but despite its strategic and economic significance the port project has attracted a lot of controversy recently because there has been local opposition against the project particularly by the local fishermen local fishermen from the coastal villages have been protesting with the backing of religious institutions and they have alleged that the construction of the port has triggered a environmental crisis leading to massive coastal erosion that has affected the coastal communities and their homes which apparently has even led to their displacement and loss of livelihood on the other hand the state and central government agencies have alleged that these protests appear to be motivated by vested interests to derail the strategic project but environmental experts point out that these concerns of fishermen are genuine considering the sensitive ecology of the region so in this context the writer of the column examines the debate between the need for developing strategic port facilities while balancing it with environmental objectives which includes coastal protection there is no doubt that the two objectives are contradictory to each other because port development activities does harm the coastline and potentially it could lead to coastal erosion but it is also true that sole focus on environmental issues could end up derailing developmental projects which could be critical for the economic needs of the country hence the writer argues that the answer to this conflict lies in sustainable coastal management and points out the discrepancies in the approach that has been adopted by the proponents of the port project through a careful examination the writer points out that the environment impact assessment report of this project has several critical errors despite which environmental clearances were granted for the project the environmental impact assessment report had failed to emphasize the impact of the project on coastal degradation which ends up having a serious consequence 
on the livelihoods of the locals. He even points out to studies conducted by the National Institute of Ocean Technology, which had noted significant coastal erosion in the area even before the project started. And the failure to account for these concerns has further accelerated coastal erosion, thereby threatening the lives and livelihoods of the fishermen. While it is true that the coastline of Kerala has been undergoing severe degradation, and while this has even been established by studies conducted by the National Centre for Sustainable Coastal Management, one cannot deny the fact that coastal degradation will be further accelerated by such large projects. It's in this context that the writer argues that the government should be focused on implementing the principle of polluter pays so that the project proponents will be held accountable for any damage caused to the environment through which the damages could be recovered by the government through penalties and use this to compensate the victims in order to provide for their rehabilitation and restoration of their livelihoods. So in short, while developmental activities are essential, it is also equally important to balance it out with environmental concerns and the answer lies in the principle of sustainable development. Now let's take up an article from page number one which deals with the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act of 2019 and the EWS quota that was introduced through this constitutional amendment. This constitutional amendment has been challenged at the Supreme Court on the basis of its constitutional validity and recently Supreme Court has started looking into these cases and it has asked the central government and state governments to answer some of its concerns with regard to EWS quota. So before we look at the observations made by the Supreme Court, first let's understand what is the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act and what is EWS quota? See, under the Indian Constitution, in Articles 14 to 16, right to equality has been enshrined. And while it prohibits any unfair discrimination, it does provide for positive discrimination on the grounds of providing affirmative action or reservation in order to uplift the socially and educationally backward classes. So this has allowed the state to provide reservation for various downtrodden and oppressed communities such as scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, and even for other backward classes. But affirmative action provided on these grounds does not take into account economic backwardness and hence, to ensure equality and justice for economically backward classes, the government introduced a historic amendment in 2019 which was the 103rd Constitutional Amendment Act. This provided for a 10% reservation quota for EWS or economically weaker sections. It provided for the amendment of Article 15 and 16 that provides for reservation in education and public employment and inserted Article 15 Clause 6 and Article 16 Clause 6. This essentially extended reservation in jobs and admission into educational institutions for economically weaker sections as well, irrespective of their castes. The government pushed for this amendment in order to promote the welfare of the weaker sections, which are left out by the reservation policy as a result of 50% cap on reservation, which is reserved to scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and other backward classes. So prior to this amendment, only social and educational backwardness was being considered for reservation. But through this, economic backwardness also became a criteria to provide for affirmative action. Those who support the amendment have argued that it addresses inequality on the grounds of economic backwardness and extends much needed reservation for the poor classes irrespective of their caste and further helps in reducing caste based discrimination as currently upper caste continue to look down upon the lower caste which enjoy reservation thus leading to the perpetuation of social discrimination and it has been argued that the 10% EWS quota provides for a level playing field in line with the spirit of right to equality, thereby addressing the discrepancies in the constitution. But critics of the amendment have pointed out that without the availability of foolproof data on economic backwardness, how will such reservation be extended by the state? And constitutional and legal experts have also argued that it breaches the cap on reservation that was placed with the Supreme Court in the landmark Indra Samni case of 1992. In this landmark ruling, 
the Supreme Court had placed a 50% cap on reservation that was kept limited for socially and educationally backward classes, that is SCs, STs and OBCs. Critics and experts have also pointed out that the criteria chosen for economic backwardness happens to be arbitrary because the baseline income levels that has been chosen to recognize economic backwardness does not take into account the per capita variations seen across states and assumes that economic backwardness across the country can be measured through a same baseline. So on these grounds, the constitutional validity of the amendment had been challenged at the Supreme Court and a constitution bench of the Supreme Court, which has been looking into the case, has brought up a few key concerns and it expects the centre and the state governments to provide answers before it decides upon the constitutional validity of the EWS quota. Now let's take up an article from page number 10 that refers to the foreign minister's meeting of the Quad countries. The Quad or the Quadrilateral refers to an informal diplomatic grouping between key strategic democratic partners that is India, Japan, Australia and the United States. These four democratic nations have come together to form a diplomatic alliance called the Quad or the Quadrilateral as all the four countries have shared interests towards the Indo-Pacific region. This grouping traces its origin to 2004 when a devastating tsunami hit the Indian Ocean and these four countries had collaborated through their navies to extend disaster relief to the affected countries. Following this, then Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe proposed the idea of a diplomatic and military alliance between these like-minded countries to stabilize the Indo-Pacific. This was roughly the period when China had started extending its influence all across the Indo-Pacific and had already started displaying its diplomatic and military aggression in the region which was affecting the interests of all the other countries in the Indo-Pacific. Japan, which primarily felt threatened by China's rise and aggression, reached out to like-minded countries such as US, India and Australia to form such an alliance to stabilize the region. Initially in 2007, even though few informal meetings took place and even the Malabar military exercise that was traditionally hosted just between India and US was elevated and India even invited Japan, Australia and Singapore to take part in the exercise. The grouping did not take shape further due to opposition from China and the pressure that China put on India following the organization of the multilateral Malabar exercise. So India went back and returned the Malabar exercise to the bilateral format involving just US and India stopped inviting Japan, Australia and Singapore. But almost a decade later, the Quad was revived by these countries following repeated incidents of aggression by China and now that all the four countries had a common interest which was to counter Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific, they formally came together and revived the Quad and India even brought back Japan and Australia into the Malabar naval exercise. While initially attempts were made by US and Japan to turn the Quad into a military grouping, India firmly resisted these attempts as India has a traditional history of not being part of any military clubs due to its independent foreign policy and ensured that the Quad and the Malabar are two separate independent initiatives. So as India and even Australia insisted that the Quad shouldn't be turned into a military alliance, it was finally accepted by US and Japan as well and from 2021, the leaders of these countries started holding regular summits and since then, the Quad has really diversified into a major grouping of the Indo-Pacific. Today it is not just focusing on diplomatic coordination and informal military exercises, but it has also diversified into several key sectors. But its top priority remains countering Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific in order to enforce a rules-based order which China has been frequently violating by picking repeated maritime disputes in the South China Sea in direct violation of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. With regard to these maritime disputes, China has displayed a lot of military and diplomatic aggression against Japan, Vietnam, Philippines and other countries and has even restricted freedom of navigation and overflight which is a guaranteed fundamental right under the UN clause. Hence, the Quad countries have committed 
to establish and enforce the rules-based order so that every country respects international rules and laws in order to retain the free and open nature of the Indo-Pacific. So apart from this primary objective, today the Quad has been diversified to look at other areas of cooperation as well, including maritime security. They have even set up a vaccine expert group to jointly combat the COVID-19 pandemic. They are also collaborating in the field of critical and emerging technologies such as cybersecurity, 5G networks, artificial intelligence, etc. Quad countries are also looking to collaborate with regard to climate action to address the risks of climate change and global warming. And they are also looking to strengthen the global supply chains in order to make them resilient to withstand the impact of shocks like COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war and also to make the global supply chains independent from Chinese control. The Quad countries have even proposed collaboration between their space agencies in order to coordinate their space research and exploration activities. Then recently, during the latest Quad summit, the United States proposed an economic initiative as well through the Quad platform called the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And around 13 countries of the region have already signed up for the initiative, including India. So in this context, the foreign ministers meeting between the Quad countries becomes important and the leaders have taken stock of China's actions and role in the Indo-Pacific and they have even reviewed the current economic crisis in Sri Lanka. They have also reviewed their COVID-19 vaccine initiative to step up vaccine production so that the pandemic can be effectively fought in the Indo-Pacific while further improving their ties in the field of emerging and critical technologies. They have also reviewed the progress of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework in order to take stock of their economic and security interests in the Indo-Pacific. Now coming to the last article from page number 12, it refers to the National Clean Air Program and its performance has been evaluated by a think tank known as the Center for Science and Environment. So in this context, first let's understand what is the National Clean Air Program. This program designed to tackle air pollution in Indian cities was launched by the Environment Ministry in 2019 and it was the first ever effort to create a national framework for air quality management and to tackle air pollution with a strict time-bound deadline and targets. The primary objective was to reduce air pollution by 20 to 30 percent, especially with focus on PM 2.5 and PM 10, that is fine particulate matter which poses the greatest risk as compared to all major air pollutants. So the target was to reduce the concentration of PM 2.5 and PM 10 by 20 to 30 percent by 2024 by using 2017 pollution levels as a baseline. The focus of the program was to implement it in 132 of India's most polluted cities which have been categorized as non-attainment cities. Non-attainment cities are those cities in India whose air quality has not met the national ambient air quality standards during the period 2011 to 2015. So these cities which had very poor air quality standards, they were chosen under the program and through this, the center would provide financial support to the concerned states provided if they would meet the targets on time. The center had made the funding conditional based on the ability of these cities to achieve the minimum prescribed target of at least 15% reduction in the concentration of PM10 levels by 2020-21 and by now they should have started reporting at least 200 good air days as laid out under the national ambient air quality standards. Any city which would fail to achieve the target would see a reduction in their funding and according to the latest study conducted by the think tank most of these cities have actually failed to achieve the target. The Central Pollution Control Board, which is the nodal agency for implementing the program and for dispersing funds, mainly considers PM10 levels, which is coarser particles as compared to PM2.5, which is finer and smaller, thereby more damaging to the respiratory system. So with regard to continuing funding under the program, PM2.5 levels are not considered by CPCB, whereas it has prioritized PM10 levels. But even with regard to PM10, most cities have not shown much progress 
over the last few years. And the study conducted by the think tank shows that out of these 132 cities, most of them have shown barely any improvement. And yet they continued receiving funds as the Central Pollution Control Board has been releasing funds based on PM10 levels without monitoring PM2.5 levels. Now let's take a look at a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, critically examine the latest developments in India-Bangladesh relationship. The second question, controversy surrounding the Visinjam port highlights the need to put port development with coastal management on a sustainable track. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the answer rating portal for which the link has been provided in the description box below. So with this, let's conclude our analysis for today. And if you like the initiative, do let us know by sharing your comments and don't forget to like the video and do subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.